fantastic that you're all here. We are delighted. Uh, I suppose you know by now this uh, is this event is sponsored by the Martha's Vineyard Chamber Music Society, and uh, this happens to be the first time we've ever had a seminar or forum, whatever. We haven't really settled on what we want to call this because we would like to have this sort of thing happen every year. Uh, this, the idea being behind all of this, uh, the proper title is creativity, music, thinking, the brain, existing, and whatever. Anyway, it's what makes life worthwhile. And we thought that, that uh, you'd like to know some of the inside secrets on how to think and how to, uh, to live in this world of creativity and music and all of that. We are more than delighted. I, I mean, I shouldn't be yeah. doing this. <laughs> These two beautiful people that are sitting up here on the stage. Uh, this is my daughter, Victoria. And uh, this is Brian and Sony, her friend. And we're all from Los Angeles, uh, even though I told Brian that I was listed as a resident of the vineyard the other day. I was shocked. I mean, it was fantastic. I finally made it. And I'm not 90 years old yet. <laughs> so anyway, we are uh, delighted to have uh, Brian and Vicki with us. Uh, they are playing, you know, tomorrow night uh, at, on our regular series, along with Paul Stevens, who is here, a horn player, and Doug Messick is in the back, a fabulous, fabulous saxophone player. And so we're going to have this quite uh, a wonderful concert tomorrow night at uh, the Wedding Church and then on Tuesday in Shore. Uh, but today, we are going to learn all kinds of things about the inside of our brain, with how to make creativity. Uh, Vicki has done a lot of work. Uh, she's written some books and papers and all this, and, and uh, has dealt with uh, foster children, where she's people that you didn't think you could have any prayer of having a, an exciting and uh, exhilarating life. And she uh, has a system that is in Actually, it's, it's being used right now in Los Angeles and will probably be nationally because they, they got a wonderful endowment uh, that the teaching has made these, these foster children just amazing people. Uh, not that they couldn't have been anyway, but this urges them on. And so Brian is a wonderful pianist. He's my colleague. We played uh, occasionally together and uh, loved every minute of it. And he, he can do anything. Actually, he can do anything. He can write music. He can play any kind of music that you put in front of him. That's, it's very discouraging. <laughs> I practice and practice, and I give it to Brian, and bingo, there it is. So he's, he's really quite amazing. So I think I've talked enough. I'd like to give to you Victoria Stevens and Brian Pazoni. <laughs> say, I am thrilled to be on the vineyard. This is my first time in my life, and it's a marvelous, marvelous surprise to me, and I want to come back. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, the way I decided, this week, how we decided we were going to start this today was I took a look at the uh, the picture that, that Vicki had chosen as the first slide, and I thought, you know, given what uh, Dolores Stevens just said, I'm going to take a further look at it and actually start off with a small improvisation, something that I haven't been prepared, that illustrates that picture, and we'll go from there. <laughs>
you. Um, I don't think we're going to say too much more about that right now and let that sit as an introduction to the whole idea of creativity. But one of the reasons we wanted to start with that is that I wanted to focus on the idea of improvisation today. And creativity is such a big subject and it's such a difficult and complex one uh, that most people have difficulty being able to figure out the difference between something that is a major historical change that is creative thinking in science or in the arts, uh, as opposed to creativity in our everyday lives. Do we all have it? Is it only geniuses? That kind of thing. And as a way of bringing all this together for this short talk today, I wanted to focus on the idea of, of improvising and think about it in terms of music, and in terms of the arts, but also in terms of our lives. Um, what does it mean to live creatively in an improvisatory way? And what, what kind of implications does that have for the quality of our lives in the sense of things like empathy and nonviolence and love and peace and some of the larger goals that we all have for the world? Um, so that's sort of, I'd like us to allow that to sit and perhaps allow the things that are coming up to inform what Brian just did. And as the, as the day goes on, afternoon goes on, when's on, um, Brian will be giving us some other uh, examples of some of the things I'm talking about, and then we'll kind of discuss it. Um, there will be some time at the end for question and answers. We'll stay around afterwards for those who want to. So if you have something really that you really want to ask, make a little note of it, and we'll just stick around and answer questions until there aren't any more. Um, so we'll hang around. There'll be refreshments and all of that. I wanted to mention one thing my mom didn't say is that Brian wrote a piece that will be premiered tomorrow night that I'm going to be singing and talking as a performer in with Doug. Massick uh, and Brian. And um, one of the things we wanted to uh, talk about today is the process of creating music. Not just improvisation itself, but creating a piece as a, as a creative artist. So you get to hear sort of the insides of how that happens and then get to see the piece tomorrow. Uh, and, and so that will be part of what we talk about today. Um, and I just want to say thank you all for coming. It's a pleasure to be here. I love coming here my whole life. I have loved it, and I see many familiar faces in the audience, and even someone that I went to high school with that I haven't seen since, <laughs> who is now an administrator in a middle school in Cambridge, and we're just reuniting for the first time since high school because she came over on the ferry because she saw we were doing this. So Joyce, I'm just thrilled you're here. <laughs> That's amazing. So I'm going to jump in then, and. Um, uh, start with my, my next slide here. Whoops, I'm sorry. Uh, this fancy gadget that I just got from David. Uh, is, I'm now not doing so well. All right. So there's a joke that goes something like this. Uh, there's a man in the snow, clearly looking for something. I can't find it, I can't find it, grumbling to himself, kind of scourging around in, in the snow. And a, a man walks by and says, well, you know, do you need some help? He says, yeah. He says, what's wrong? Well, I lost my keys. And so he said, well, I'll help you. So they both are down on their hands and knees, looking, looking, looking under this street light. And finally, the second man says, well, do you remember where you lost those keys? And the man says, well, yeah, down that road, pointing down the dark road. He says, well, why are we looking down there? He said, well, the light's better over here. <laughs> so how many things do we look for in the light because it's more easy to quantify, it's more easy to categorize, it's more easy to understand those things in the light. Creativity is one of those things in the dark. There are other things in the dark that we can't quantify, like faith and love and hope and trust. You can't open up your brain and find it. And people are wondering with creativity, where do we find it in the brain, right? And how do we find the cause of that? Um, and just like all these other large kinds of qualities that make life worth living, um, they're highly complex, highly mysterious, and difficult to identify. And as such, we wonder, well, how do you get it? How do you develop it? 
How would you teach it? How would you nurture it? Uh, do you just have it or not? So what are some of the things over there in the dark? Well, one thing I wanted to share with you is as a psychologist and a person who works with children, right now in the world it's such an exciting time because there's a paradigm shift going on in psychology which is bringing us to an understanding of the emotions and the body for creative thinking and what we call higher order thinking. And that is a shift from an emphasis on rational analytic thought as controlling the body and emotions to understanding that the emotions allow us to use our thinking well. In other words, without being grounded in our body and emotions, we don't have the ability to use the information stored in our brain in a thoughtful way to make informed choices, to have good judgment, right? Contextual judgment based on our values and our principles and our ability to read a situation well. So some of the things over there in the dark that I would like to say are linked to creative thinking, creativity in general, um, which are quite important right now in the world. And this shift is happening um, all over psychology and not yet made its way into education, I might add. The importance of unconscious processing and emotional regulation for the ability to use stored information, knowledge, and learned skills for analytical, critical, and creative thinking. Now that's a big switch, isn't it? The importance of unconscious processing and emotional regulation for the ability to use the information we've stored and learned, all the facts, all the information, and our knowledge and learned skills for analytical, critical, and creative thinking. You see how it's turning, it's on, it's turning Descartes on his head, right? <laughs> so instead of I think, therefore I am, we're now saying I am, therefore I feel, therefore I think, you see? So it's all like that. And this takes the arts into a very different place in education, doesn't it? Because the arts are the language of the body and emotions. Music being very important developmentally in, those, in, in, in the larger view of all the arts. The importance of schooling the unconscious imagination and the symbolic language of the emotions, developing a sense of personal agency and self-motivation. The opposite of agency is depression or apathy. A sense of, it doesn't matter what I do, nothing's going to make any difference anyway. No one's going to hear me, no one's going to see me. The foster youth, the at-risk youth that I work with, feel that it doesn't matter what they do because no one's going to care anyway. They don't have a voice, and they don't have a voice anyone cares to listen to. So then they resort to other things, like graffiti, violence, other, in, it's like, do you hear me now? <laughs> How about now, right? And finally people do, but not in the way that their creativity would speak in a way we would call positive, and yet it's still creative. Um, this is very important piece here um, because the brain is plastic and, that, and, 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 and we are now learning so much about how do we actually school the unconscious. And again, the arts are going to be very important in this. The importance of imaginative play and time for undirected exploration and no right answers and improvisation as a way of thinking creatively in any area of life. And this is a very difficult one, isn't it? When we have grown up in a culture where there are right answers and wrong answers, and we need to have the right way, right? Um, and so a, what do we, and we're going to be talking about a space for not knowing, a space for not having the right answer right away as being critical for creative thinking. So what is creativity? What is it? Um, we talk about a creative product meaning something somebody does that, that we as a society would deem as, that is creative, right? It is novel. It is something unique. It is innovative. There's a discovery. There is something that changes our way of thinking in a particular domain. There's a creative person, right? They are a creative person who thinks and acts creatively. Some people today call them creatives. Um, and then there's a the creative process. So what I'm going to focus on today is the creative process, because that is the area that we can, we can develop in ourselves. And interestingly enough, I hope that you will find, as you think about what I'm talking about today, how creative each of you are. And maybe you wouldn't label yourself such. Often I work with people that say, well, I'm not creative. Well, who is? Oh, that pianist or that artist. And so 
the, your, your own unique creativity, right? And to, to be able to understand that. So the creative process is what I'm going to focus on, specifically creative thinking. Um, so just as a little game for us, I would like you to think to yourself, which number is most different from the other numbers? So which number is most different from the other numbers? And if you have an answer, go ahead and shout it out. Yes? 31. And why would that be? Because it's two. Two, two words, right? Okay, excellent. Yes. One. Okay, why? Yeah, the two have one and three. Beautiful. Yes, another. I'm not sure if he said what I was thinking. Um, one is one digit and the other are two digits. Is that what he said? Yep. Yes. Yeah, sorry. Yes. Great minus a thing along. <laughs> yes. 13 because it doesn't have the number one in it. Excellent. Very good. All right. Uh, very creative answers and all wonderful. Yeah. Anybody else? Would, uh, how many people would say one? Uh, how many? 13? 31? Okay. Um, what would you say if I said all wonderful answers and yet none of those are the right answer for this particular question? <laughs> You're wrong. <laughs> Did my mother tell you to say that? Uh, the answer is two. How many of you did not consider two as even a choice? That was my choice. Most of them. Speak up. What we tend to do, and the reason for this puzzle, it's a famous puzzle, and this is uh, one of several things that we do in psychology, cognitive psychology, to be able to just uncover our natural biases is to do something like this. And notice when we have, uh, first of all, a different way of symbolizing the number, but with word or a number, but also this little symbol here. And so all of a sudden your mind automatically says, okay, we don't even consider these, and we're just going to only take these three. And this has broad implications for creative thinking. In other words, how many possibilities actually exist, but our mind has already truncated the, the number and narrowed it to a very small area that we think we have to choose from, when in fact there are multiple possibilities. So how do we think in a way that broadens and goes beyond these biases, these natural ways of categorizing labels? Well, I can do this, I can't do that. I'm too young, I'm too old, I can't do that. My mother said I couldn't do that. Well, only these kind of people do that, and I can't do that, it's too late. Blah, blah, blah. These are all these things, right? right? I get that in schools when they say, well, uh, you're gonna be working with Sam next year, and he's ADD. Thank you very much. We just put, stuck that right on Sam, stuck it in my mind, and now that's how I'm seeing him, right? I've now limited. So this is about limiting, and yet we need this limitation in order to be able to categorize and label, in order to store information well and predict for the future. We need that. So creative thinking goes against the grain of the natural way of thinking of the mind in one sense, that we want order and we want it quick and fast and don't mess with it. Right? We call it you know, close enough for jazz, you know, quick and dirty. If it's getting loud and it's getting big fast, move. Right? We don't want to say, well, I wonder, is that a mirage or is that like a painting? Is that something that somebody is doing as performance art? No, you get out of the way. Right? But the creative thinker then would be able to ask those questions in a safe environment. So how can we create these environments for ourselves to think? And I'm not doing the, the box puzzle for the, for the mathematicians in the room, the nine dot puzzle, that enables you to understand what that box is and thinking outside of it. But the answer to that is there is no box. There's only the boxes we create in order to make meaning so that we don't go crazy and feel like we're living in chaos. But the boxes are not real. So creative thinking then is questioning our own assumptions and those that we've inherited, okay? So here are some myths. Quickly, I'll go through them. It's a gift that can't be taught. It's just genius. No, not true. It's only rebellious against the system. Not necessarily true at all. Uh, right brain, not left brain. Not true. Uh, only those that are artistic and make art, often only professionally. Not true. All about freedom and no constraints. The opposite is true. The more security and constraints, the more creativity. That is the uh, is absolutely the opposite. Um, intuition and not logical, not true. There is a logic to emotions and a logic to creativity that just may be different than a more analytical kind of logic. Uh, both <coughs> creativity 
uh, and mental illness or craziness. You gotta be crazy, depressed, schizophrenic, bipolar, right? Not necessarily at all. Um, related to high IQ, not true. Um, creative thinking is, is not a form of intelligence, not true. It cannot be assessed, that is not true. There are ways of doing it. And big C, little c is what I was referring to earlier. Big C would be the big historical domain paradigm shifts. Right, Einstein, Newton, Copernicus, right? We've changed everything. Steve Jobs, right? Paradigm shifts, right? Little c is everyday creativity. So big C, little c is a distinction. We also sometimes say personal and historical. That is really useful for us. Um, so I just talked about that. So I'd like to say a few words before we move into the next section about education. Um, this is by Richard Florida, who is an economist, talking about the future of our country and the world in terms of creativity. And he says, human creativity is the ultimate economic resource. The ability to come up with new ideas and better ways of doing things is ultimately what raises productivity and thus living standards. Creativity is the great leveler. It cannot be handed down. It cannot be owned in the traditional sense. It defies gender, race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, and outward appearance. Yet our society continues to encourage the creative talents of a minority, i.e. the quote unquote gifted, while it neglects the creative capacities of many more. This is a tragedy. There are children that say to me, well, I'm not creative, I'm not gifted. They were told that, right? So creativity is something that can't be, well, it, it, it goes beyond 21st century skills, which I'm going to talk about now, uh, but goes into um, a way of living. And if that is not developed in children, they are being deprived of something critical. Um, so skills necessary for success in the 21st century workplace. Creativity, creative thinking, innovation and imagination, originality and inventiveness, cognitive play, open and receptive to new perspectives, understanding interconnections between ideas and systems, and collaboration and the ability to work effectively with teams. These are considered to be the skills that our students are going to need, our children, when they graduate. And that's over and above technical, specific knowledge in a particular domain. It doesn't, it isn't, doesn't replace it. It's over and above. But these are the things that are over in the dark. These are the mushy things. These are the things that we say, well, we can't assess those. We need standardized tests that have multiple choice bubbles that you fill in. Well, I don't know anybody that got a job by filling in a bubble, right? It's good to have those skills and measure them because we can. But those things that are measured are not the goal. Those are the things that get you to the goal. It's as if we're teaching our kids to play scales and music, and then they get graded on how well they play the scales, and they never play the music. The music is thinking. The music is creative collaboration. The music is innovation. The music is emp empathic communication, right? And so these skills are critical for our students. What employers say, out of 300 employers surveyed, they said that only approximately one in four prospective employees were prepared for the workplace with a college degree. Skills they said that were necessary and missing in most, effective oral and written communication, critical thinking and analytical skills, the ability to apply information and skills to real world settings, that's improvisation. Complex problem solving, the ability to connect choice and actions to ethical decisions. How often do we hear that, right? So are our kids ready for success after graduation, even if they do well? An IBM poll of 1,500 CEOs say that creativity is the number one leadership competency of the future. A recent study shows that creativity has been decreasing in our students over the past 20 years with K-6, kindergarten through sixth grade, um, having the most serious decline. The authors conclude that there is no concerted effort to nurture the creativity of our children in the United States, while the EU, China, Singapore, and other nations are making it a top educational priority. So, I have this as my point of view. <laughs> there are ways to assess what I'm talking about. And, but by narrowing the measure of intelligence to these specific standardized tests, what we're doing is we are not being able to understand the creative thinking in so many different domains of so many other children. Right. 
So I, here we're going to focus in on creative thinking and creative play. So I'm, I'm giving you a little definition here. Creative problem solving and imaginative play are what we're speaking about here. And what's within that is this. Seeing relationships and connections. So thinking analogically, metaphorically. How is this related to that? How do we understand the similarities and differences between two things? Playing with multiple answers to a problem. How about that? So you get an A for having the most possible answers, not the right answer, right? Easy test, right? Um, adaptability, flexibility, fluidity, tolerating and embracing ambiguity as well as frustration, right? Being able to not know and not need an answer immediately. These are all part of the skills implied in creative thinking and creative play. And now I'm speaking across the board. So one of the main themes in all forms of creativity is this. It involves putting together two things. Now think of this biblically. Think of this in terms of every myth we've seen. Think of it as intercourse, create, you know, the evolution, right? We're putting things together and creating something new, right? Whether it's ideas or humans or new, new genetic kind of combinations. Whether they're thoughts, objects, colors, sounds, words, it's always putting two things together. So this synthesis involves the ability to perceive similarities and differences, and similarities within differences, as well as the differences within similarities, without making them the same or different. So what I can say is, well, you and I have similarities, we have differences, but just because you don't think the same way I do about something doesn't mean that you and I are, that, that you are totally different, right? It's, it's the us versus them, black, white thinking versus the gray. So we're talking gray, 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 and how do we increase the ability to play in gray, right? So the key is relationships between disparate things, connections, and links. This is called combinatory play. And again, for those of you, I know there are a lot of engineers in this room because I've talked personally to several of them. Einstein coined this term, combinatory play. And he said that his theories came from imaginative, muscular, visual, combinatory play with thought experiments before he wrote anything down on paper. This is the essence of creativity and innovation in any field. Science, mathematics, engineering, technology, and the arts. As well as creativity in any activity in everyday life. This imaginative, combinatory play that is the focus today. And I will add one thing, that we hear a lot in education about STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. I'm seeing nodding heads. Well, what we're adding today is an A, and making that STEAM, science, technology, engineering, the arts, and math. And this is across this country. I just gave a webinar for the heads of the arts in every state in the country on this subject. And right now, Massachusetts has a creativity index, and everyone's very interested in this subject in very big ways for good reasons. So the combinatory play is the focus, and that's what Brian's going to give us an example of right now uh, on the piano. <laughs> and uh, he'll explain. Yeah. Thank you for that introduction and, and uh, explanation of creativity. Brilliant. Um, I won't talk quite as much um, because I, I, I can't possibly. <laughs> I, I, I will say that in, in terms of improvisation from a musical standpoint, uh, as I see it, I've always told people and students he said, well, you know, when you walk around and you say hello to people and you have a conversation, um, you actually do not pull out a piece of paper out of your pocket and say, hello, and the other person doesn't pull out a piece of paper and says, hello, with a script on it, you know, to then go through your conversation and says, how are you, and then you pull out a few other pieces of paper. And for me, that's, that's analogous to playing written music which is fun when you're, when you're following the script and reciting your play. Improvisation, to me, is simply speaking, you know? So we have a language and we have a grammar that we've all, you know, communally developed. We have disagreements about words, but, you know, that's, um, 
you know, sort of secondary to what I'm saying. So for me, uh, improvisation is just speaking. There are different ways to and from my personal self to improvise and to speak. There's, there's, there's speaking regularly, there's speaking uh, in more of a soothing kind of emotional way, there's speaking from the heart. As a matter of fact, I don't, I'm not even sure if I, maybe this is, I, I originally grew up in Pennsylvania, uh, but I, I did import some Californies into me uh, after having been there. I called it, I made these correlations to uh, full, Full chakra related musical experiences, and, and I started to make the case that um, uh, that, that most primitive and ethereal musics, you know, came from the root chakra connected to the crown, and then second to that, you know, our trance musics came from our our uh, creator chakra up, up through what they call the third eye, and that you know most of Western music, but the music that grabs you by the neck, which was Beethoven. The Mozart that made you listen basically was coming from your power, see the power and also your voice. And that the songs that we sang that we love, that people um, respond to emotionally, just came straight from the heart. So that was that was one of the ways in which I organized different ways of being expressed, being uh, that people have been able to use music to, you know, express themselves through from you know to to, to illustrate or communicate different aspects of what the human experience is. So, in reference to combinatorial play, we decided to go sort of backwards. Um, and what I like to do is, when I'm first of all accessing, uh, I, I started playing the piano when I was about one and a half years old. Um, and I, the reason I did that is my mother became ill and we moved into her parents' place. And down the alleyway, there was a piano. So my uncle used to walk me down here every day, and I used to play the piano. And what it was for me was this wonderful tabula rasa that I, I didn't know what it was. I only knew that I wanted to be there. I didn't know what notes were called. I just knew that, you know, if you played something soft, it was soft. I know how to play something soft. I knew high, I knew low, I knew new to me as a one and a half year old what, what sounded pretty, and I knew, I knew kind of what sounded a little not so pretty. So that's how I engaged myself at the instrument, probably very much the way you know, children today engage themselves in the computer games and, you know, as, as a further comfort mechanism. So I engage myself on a day-to-day -day basis at the piano doing the very same kinds of things to find a, a, a place where basically I was comforting myself, I was expressing myself, and I was discovering things. And I was obsessive, I needed to be there. So from, from that point on, I started to play popular music, I started to play, every, play everything off the radio, all the songs my mother loved, I started to play by ear, I started to then you know, take classical lessons and learn how to read written notes. And, and the basic story is, is that when, when, when Dee so graciously said he can do anything, well, that, that was the genesis of it. It was from you know, being, being positioned that way to, to, to relate to music with my hands, with the synapses still growing as a child, you know, to be able to speak musical language. So the part of the combinatorial play is what, what I'd like to do now is take that whole sort of up to the present sort of bed of my languages and involve you all into something that I'm going to combine together the best I can into a um, collaborative improvisation. So what I'd like to hear from you know, any, anybody in the audience is just call out a tune, call out a style, call out a composer, call out anything you want. I'm gonna write it on a sheet of paper and I'm gonna use from this, whatever's inside of there to create a piece of music for you. Sergeant Pepper. Sergeant Pepper, perfect. Okay. Yes. The blues. The blues. I go on. Yes. What a wonderful world. What a wonderful world. Oh my goodness. Yes. Bronx. Bronx. Sunny side of the street. The sunny side of the street. Do I get to sing or yeah. uh, what, what, you want any more? Well, you know, uh, yeah. we have a lot of optimists in here. Um, yes. yes. How about a giant? What? Oh, the A-train. Oh, 
right? Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace. Yes. Brightness. What? Sparkles. Sparkles. Brightness. Brightness. Oh, yeah. Nice. What were you saying? A chant. A chant. A chant. Okay, I said a Hawaiian chant, but Hawaiian is familiar with that. Okay. Yes. Verity's Requiem. Verity's Requiem. What about launch? Excellent. I love this. <laughs> okay. Well, Sergeant Pepper's the Blues, what a wonderful world. Brahms, Sunny Side of the Street. We have um, A Train, Amazing Grace, Bright. Uh, we have Hawaiian Chant, which you know, I'll try to simulate <laughs> Hawaiian Chant style. Uh, Verity's Requiem and Piazzolla. So I'll, I'll play you a piece of music that what I'm going to do is look at this piece of paper and basically simultaneously access all these tunes and these styles and put, the, put them together more or less, not so much in a medley from one to one, but as in overlays and as a, as a, as a combinatorial piece. So, okay, there. thank you.
That's, that's one of the better ones. <laughs> that's, that's, that's fantastic. Yes. Um, all right. So one of the things that I'd like to talk about now, um, and we'll keep in mind the two improvisations we've had so far uh, through the instrument of Brian, <laughs> um, including his brain. Uh, I'd like to focus now a little bit about that and talk about the right brain, the left brain, and this myth about uh, creative people are right-brained and musical people are right-brained and mathematical people are left-brained. And the truth is creativity involves both hemispheres of the brain, but operating together and yet with one being dominant at different times. Um, and what we're looking for are these bridges between the two. And that's this area of connection, and combinatory play, analogy, metaphor, connection, connection. And Brian just did that, combining his training with what you, with, with what the, uh, the ideas that you had, um, with his own feeling in the moment and how those could go together. It's all about this combining in order to transform these elements that are all known into something new. And that's different than copying, isn't it? It's taking something known and it's transformed completely into something new. And so when we're talking about the brain, we've got the right hemisphere that is, has to do with the melody of music, it has to do with the big picture, gestalt, the relationship between things. The left, more for analyzing, categorizing, labeling, storing information and facts. And we need both. And yet with language, we have uh, our speaking and our hearing language centers on the left side of the brain, but our right is what processes the melody of language, right? The rhythm of language, the timbre of language. So we're always using both. In addition, once you have become skilled in something, it becomes much more on the left side of the brain lit up when we do scans. When, and the reason for that is you've practiced, you've studied, you've studied, you've studied, and that takes a lot of our emotional energy. A right hemisphere is linked to the emotional brain. It's difficult. It takes patience, it's boring, it's hard, it doesn't sound good, right? We have to tolerate a lot of frustration and then we get better, we get better, we get better and then all of a sudden it's in your bones, it's in your body and it goes, whoop, stored, right? And then it's unconscious, automatic, learned skills, right? More over in the left. So a musical, a, a, a person who's not musically trained will show a very strong right brain listening to music, but professional musicians show almost no right and all left. Now the same thing is true of everybody with areas of expertise. The right brain is dealing with novelty, with the new, and then the left comes in with the learned knowledge, and we need both all of the time. What's interesting, and we've talked about this quite a bit, I'll, I'll just touch on it for just a second, which is that if you are easily overloaded because of early experiences of trauma, um, or because of exquisite sensitivity for some reason, you might tr find novelty as something that is overwhelming, shut down, and not be able to hold open your attention long enough to learn something new and tolerate the discomfort that comes with the new. And so with the emotional regulation that I talked about earlier, we need that in order to open up that right hemisphere, allow for this discomfort and the, you know, learning some, learning that maybe our, our biases weren't quite correct or maybe what we used to do doesn't work so well anymore. Opening up that discomfort and then moving over, bringing our information and updating it constantly, opening up. So this is a right-left brain bi-hemispheric play. So when we talk about combinatory play, it's right-left, right-left, up-down, 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 okay? And so I'll do a little trick exercise with you. And so here's the game here. Look at the chart and say the color out loud and not the word starting at the top and say it all as a group when I say go, out loud, the color, not the word. Ready? Go. Green, red, blue, yellow, blue, black, red, blue, green, black, red, yellow, green, blue, black, blue, red, green. <laughs> Did you feel that a little bit of dissonance in there? Right. So your right hemisphere is reading the color, the left the word, and when there's a little bit of that, you can feel that, right? So what in combinatory 
play great if you were opening up that space for tolerance. And this is called a Stroop test for the psychology, anybody in psychology. Um, that is a test of fluid creative thinking and not being stuck in one way or another. Um, so Poincaré was a famous mathematician. And Poincaré uh, was very interested in his own creative process in mathematics. So he observed his own process as he came up with um, what later became known as the, the fusion theorems. And there was a man named Jacques Hadamard that contacted Poincaré, as well as Einstein and some other scientists and mathematicians, because he wanted to know how do you come up with your creative ideas in science. So Poincaré came up with these four stages of his own process. And an example of this, I'll go over them in just a second, is that there was a man who was an expert on zippers and buttons and fasteners and hooks and eyes in fashion, and he was on a hike up in the mountains. You know when you're on a hike and you get those burrs in your socks, those little teeny burrs, and they're a little difficult to get out? And so for most of us, it's like annoying, right? Or it's irritating, and you have to pull them out, they're hard. So, but him, with his expertise in fashion, put that together with the burrs, and guess what he came up with? I'm sure you already know. Velcro, exactly. So the prepared mind is the creative mind. And so in any area, we have our area of training and expertise, and we bring in the new, and then we combine it together. And instead of saying, oh, isn't that terrible, we say, oh, isn't that interesting, right? Look at what we can do here. So the four stages Poincaré codified, some of you may have heard of, because they've been there have been variations on these over the years. But these are the basic four stages. Preparation, immersion, work, discipline, practice, over and over and over again. Learning one's field and the specifics of a given problem. Everything you can learn about it, all the basics, all the fundamentals, research, you know, all of that goes in preparation. Now the next stage after preparation, which by the way does take some of that emotional ability to tolerate discomfort, doesn't it? Because it practice is often tedious, <laughs> right? And it takes a long time. But once we get past the practice, it could be short, it could be longer, depending on the situation. We go into incubation. Now, incubation is a stage where we put aside our conscious work on a problem, meaning our focus out here. And we go, I'm going to do something else. I'm going to fish. I'm going to cook. I'm going to uh, wash the dishes. I'm going to do something. And and usually it's physical. Shower, some of this happens in the shower. If you think back in your own life, where all of a sudden we work, 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 and like the heck with it. Now we're gonna go do something else, and we say, oh, I see, comes together. That's because your unconscious mind was allowed to play and make those com combinations. Our conscious mind said, oh, that's ridiculous. Those two things don't go together. And your unconscious mind says, sure they can. The unconscious mind in incubation is like the dreaming mind that brings together things that ordinarily we wouldn't. It's also the same logic in art. We put these things together and they make sense, but they don't necessarily have a clear logical narrative. So incubation is mental, unconscious play that is going on while we're awake. It's a state where we're allowing something to play in the back of our mind, and then we are primed and ready for, for the new to come in and for the synthesis to happen. And the illumination is that insight. You've heard of the aha moment. Aha, got it. Synthesis, illumination. That is not what creative thinking is really about. That's the result of creative thinking. You see what I'm saying? All right. So the aha moment is discovery. It's the synthesis of the disparate elements in a new way, solving a problem. And then we come back out to the world and say, is this any good? Does this work? We, verification is a highly conscious, deliberate act. Does this fit? Is this idea any good? Experimentation. Now we've come up with it. Now we have to now do some other you know, kinds of work to find out if it's something that's valid. Now we're back in preparation. We go back in the cycle. So this is a cycle. It's a process that goes around and around and around. And this is true in every field, um, in the arts, in science, in math. In other words, this is the creative process, whether it's little c or big C, and whether it's the arts or any other field. Right? This is, this is basically the process. And all of you can probably think of times when you went through this. You just didn't know that these were the stages necessarily and call them such. There's a famous, Poincaré referenced to the famous story of Archimedes, who was um, given the task of finding out how much gold was in the crown of the king of Thebes and without melting it. 
right? Hmm, how do I do that? Work, 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 work. Finally, the heck with it, took a bath. And then once he's in the bathtub, what happens? Displacement of the water. Aha, I have it. Eureka, he shouts, and runs naked through the streets of Thebes. Right? And so this is an example. But again, he wouldn't have that illumination had he not had the preparation, discipline, practice, and knowledge. So we've got to have those basics. Right? So do you want to say something about that? Not much. Um, <laughs> I will want to put the microphone back together. <laughs> sure, I'll use yours. I'll do that while you're talking. <laughs> Yeah, we, we discussed me talking about this aspect. You know, one, and I'll reel back a few frames. Uh, one of the things that occurred to me when I started talking about uh, starting at one and a half was that the obvious question, well, well, Brian, you started at one and a half and have this, you know, had that luxury of not having people impose their ideas on you right away. Therefore, you could develop this facility to do this. And this is really a low percentage thing. And what I, this, so going back, I just wanted to reiterate that what you, what you are discovering and, and bringing into the public and educational eye is that you can actually develop, and there are ways that are being developed to, to create those very conditions from pre-kindergarten, post-birth, to be able to develop this way of being yeah, in, in the world. Now, in terms of, um, of, this, of, of Frank Carr's um, methodology, I was simply thinking about how, how it was that I started. Well, I started by imitating um, um, it from the popular end, and I started by reading notes and getting them right and playing scales and arpeggios. And then, uh, for instance, something like, like this would happen. I'll use a, I'll use a popular tune to describe it. Um, so we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna do number, number, number one as a, as a little boy saying, let me find, figure out how to play this piece. These, actually, these two pieces. cartoons. <laughs> uh, my friend from Pittsburgh, Vince Garaldi, grew up in Pittsburgh. Okay, so, so I go out and play football and baseball and whatever with my friends, and I come back in the house and, and do this. Is I, I said, there must be a better way to improvise than what started happening in the 60s, which basically sounded like this. I mean, we, we went from, if, if, you, if you look at a, a jazz book, that's why I'm using, I, I don't mind the word jazz. We'll, we'll put the word jazz in there, but if we use improvisation to, to be the large, large group and then jazz as being a subset, the lineage of jazz pretty much went this way. Uh, <laughs> from, from going there to going there. I said, 
There must be a way, given what I have done in the first two steps, to take and then use my more developed mind to work on um, the actual molecular connections of music. And so what I would start to do is practice with the metronome simple relations, dividing music down into really its component parts that come from different kinds of theories. And so that allowed me to develop a way of, of creating and combining my instinct for overlay into something that then might sound like, like this. I have a, I, well, I do have the piece of paper with me. This is, this is totally spontaneous. I'll show this to you that it's worth seeing. Um, Some, some people have copies of this. Um, some of my students had copies of this and said, Brian, you should write a book. And I said, well, you write the book and I'll take a percentage. This is my Copernican Einsteinian version of E equals MC squared. Okay, but if I were to explain it to you, you would see then how all the different elements of uh, uh, music in terms of function or in terms of mode and other things all came together to say, oh, this style is not the center of the open song system. Neither is this style, neither is this style. But this field of possibilities that you're discovering, you know, by graduated steps and recombining, actually can give rise to anything. So I might do a version based on then having practiced for years through my 20s, this method that I developed, I might play those two pieces this way. stage, I think what I got from the illumination stage, um, even though it might not be the same as your thing, you're talking about, well, if it worked, and if people liked it, I was encouraged to recycle the process over and over and over and over again, or the validation stage. The, the verification. So the verification stage. So if you like that, I experienced the verification stage of, of the process that I developed from the time I was a child into, you know, when I thought I was getting smarter into what happened. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. So, um, a little bit of neuroscience just to touch here um, about this subject. Uh, recent brain imaging research shows that there is a slowdown in our left frontal cortex and a shutting down of the visual cortex in moments right before a flash of insight or that aha with a burst in the right temporal lobe. So what's interesting about that is it suggests that the brain starts cutting out the external stimuli and for the sensory input to increase connections between the conscious and unconscious mind letting it play. And this is now in brain scans, we see this. That there's a, we work, work on the outside work practice and then there's a shutting down of that input. I've had enough, now I have to play internally. And this could take a form of a quiet time, uh, something physical, like we said, something repetitive often that then gives us a time to allow this complex work to be done in our unconscious mind. And again, what neuroscience 
science is, is validating for us is, again, and a lot of this is common sense, right? What all of us have already intuitively known. Because uh, this is the, the voice of intuition talking, which is that most of our processing, 99.9% .9 of it, is unconscious all the time. And very little are those flashes of insight awareness coming together that we are conscious of. Um, so most of our thinking is actually going on unconsciously. And that word has sort of gotten a bad rap because of psychoanalysis over the years. But it is a form of dreaming while you're awake. Um, and so this idea of, of a looking at daydreaming, and for the educators in the room, this is critical information. Uh, how many of us were told that's bad to daydream and you shouldn't doodle, right? And these, and, and what we now know is this is work. Right? We're working on something, right? And so current research shows that people who solve problems through insight have literally different brain patterns than those who don't. So the brain is most actively engaged when our mind is wandering. In other words, you are using more parts of your brain, more energy in your brain when you're wandering, daydreaming, and doodling, and playing than when it's a deliberate, specific, narrow focus. Which again, makes common sense when you think about it, right? So it's more active than when we're reasoning with a specific complex problem. So there's a high neural frequency in the right, again, frontal cortex that appears, look at this, eight seconds before we're even aware of something consciously. In other words, with brain scans, they are showing that there's awareness and a spark in the right eight seconds before the person reports acknowledging the awareness of whatever happened. All right? So it's unconscious, it's fast, it's lightning fast, hooked into the right hemisphere, the emotional brain, the body, and the left is slow, 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 right? So, and you know this, that when you've been upset, angry, excited, emotionally, something is going on, I mean, what we do is we are responding immediately Right? Our body responds. And then it takes a long while before our brain says, okay, what is really going on here? Do we have even words for this? Right? We, we're searching for it. Um, and so, and often our, our left brain is sort of coming up with a story to tell the emotional experience that the right body is even having. Um, so this is something that we, that we know is true. And again, with creativity, innovation, and insight, how do we develop this? We need to build in these spaces which don't exist if it's just stimulation, 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 no play. In other words, this also takes music, the arts, but also play into a place of critical importance for learning. And again, I'm playing, placing play not only as practice and as a cognitive skill, but also as the highest level of thinking imaginatively. In other words, empathy, empathic attunement is itself um, a, a imaginative combinatory play. I wonder what it's like to be you. I wonder what it's like to be on Mars with the rover. I wonder what it's like to be an ant. I wonder what it's like to be dead. I wonder, and all of this are the creative thinking of the people that have big C and little C. I wonder what it's like to have a world where everyone's treated equal. I wonder what it's like, right? To have a, 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 a political system that isn't based on monarchy. Or dictatorship, ah, democracy, what is that, right? And actually creative thinking is itself inherent within democracy, isn't it? Because it's all about a variety of diverse opinions and points of view and ways of being that are similar and different, all working and listening to each other without defaulting to the same or different. And if you're different, you're bad. You're out, right? It's not like, well, I was gonna say Project Runway for those people that watch Project Runway. In, in fashion, you're in or you're out. How you put it. Um, but, but on a serious note, that is racism, stereotyping, totalitarianism. It's either this or that. The, the either and is the language and the logic of the creative mind. And that is the language of democracy. And how difficult it is to hold on to that. Because it's much easier to default to the, well, it's either this or that. It's A or B. Not A and B, don't mess with me. I don't like that gray area. You know, don't give me, so how do we increase our tolerance for ambiguity? That is the key in my mind to empathy, which is the key to nonviolence, right? So, and again, how do we teach that in the schools? That's my work, that's what I do. Um, and I will add this about jazz musicians. To just add to this, they've just done brain scans on jazz musicians when they're doing improvisation, and they show a large region of the brain involved in monitoring our performance is shut down. So our self-talk and our self-monitoring is shut down, while a small region involved in organizing our thoughts and linking to our like, knowledge is very highly activated. Right? 
But we're taking out judgment, we're taking out thinking about thinking right at that moment and just being in the moment, or what we call flow, a flow state. But it's high, it's a it's form of consciousness linked to the unconscious with a fluid openness. I call it a third space, the creative transformational flux. Um, so researchers propose that this and several related patterns are likely to be key, key indicators of a brain that is engaged in highly creative thought in anyone. Right? This is done at John, Johns Hopkins. Um, so I like. So I'm going to end this section by talking about boundaries. That creativity is sparked by boundaries, and it finds its satisfaction in new connections across boundaries. In other words, without boundaries and labels and organization, we have chaos. From chaos, we have disorganization and no creativity. Creativity needs the boundaries in order for us to explore beyond them, to question them, to let them bend, right? To find new combinations. And David Perkins, who's from Harvard, I love this quote, this creative business person, dancer or engineer, needs curiosity and boundaries, restlessness concerning their limits, and toughness in tolerating the ambiguity that inevitably appears when boundaries are challenged. These are difficult things to develop, aren't they? The emotional regulation that is the toughness that is in tolerating ambiguity directly is linked to impulse control in all adults and children. How can I wait before getting that? Delay of gratification, tolerating frustration. I will work in order to get that. I don't need to just have it now, right? All right. So. Training, discipline, practice, structure, and constraints are necessary for creative, imaginative, combinatory play and mastery in any field, as well as the ability to let go of assumptions and quote-unquote truths and tolerate the disruption that is part of curiosity, wonder, questioning, growth, learning, and transformation. So with that, uh, Brian is going to take us into a different kind of improvisation with a structure. And he's going to take Mozart, and he's going to take pieces and improvise in between pieces of Mozart. This is something when I do my programs, I call a Mozart club sandwich. <laughs> um, the reason I call it a club sandwich is that there are various layers of bread and various layers of stuff between the bread. And uh, sometimes it could be quite a high stack. Sometimes it could be open face, closed face. People have argued as to which is the bread and which is the meat, or which is the goop and you know, which is the uh, grain. Um, and what, what I do is I carry around my copies of Mozart sonatas, and I today what I did is I, I kind of thumbed through them and I picked out a couple movements that I like. One of them I haven't seen in a long time. It's a, it's a slower pace. And, and the other I've done more often. It's uh, from the F major sonata. And what I'd like to do is this, this version of the club sandwich is going to start. Um, I, I think I want to start it a little bit with uh, an improvisation that's more in the style of Mozart and in the classical style. So for instance, where I have to where I have to use my impulse control is to not do something like this. That's that's cheeky, it's very French, it's very nice, but that would have been my century. I would go. So I'm gonna, what I'm going to do is seamlessly, maybe I'll make a little seam, just so you can tell, um, between an improvisation, a little bit of a, a slow movement of a G major uh, Mozart sonata, and then do another seam to transition me to a faster sonata that's in C major, um, and bring it to a close, like that. Wait, wait, you want to say what? We have a, um, just a five minutes. Oh, so they do, you want me to do a mini version? A mini version. Okay, <laughs> do a miniature version. Okay. Yeah.
That's even better. Okay. That requires There's more constraints right there. There's more constraints. I promise, but they were kind of there. Right. Okay, so we've been talking about um, a brief uh, little uh, tour around the ideas of creativity, uh, music, and the brain. And um, so I'd like to, to, to close with this uh, little story. And, and what I'd like to do is hone in on music and the importance of music, and, um, and not just about uh, creative thinking and the big picture, but the, the little picture about how it affects all of our lives. And I know that all of you are here for one, for, for, for reasons that are personal, having to do with your own connection with music, with creative thinking. Um, but, uh, but music touches us all in different ways. Um, our first experience of love and care is musical through the sounds and the melodies of the mother and father's voices while we're in the womb, uh, while we're hearing the rhythm, the rhythm of the heartbeat and the digestive sounds. We're hearing the presence and absence of melody. Uh, the ear is online at four months in utero. And so music is our first experience of presence and absence, which is interesting. Our first experience of something not being there and being um, something that is continuous. And that's one of the reasons we now hypothesize that musical memory is the last to go when we are beginning to have difficulties with memory in older age, which is interesting, that our me musical memories are robust. Uh, even through losing episodic memory and narrative memory whoops, throughout our lifetime. <laughs> and um, at any rate, um, and, and in addition, uh, when we talk about music and education, uh, we're going, we, we now know that there is nothing causal that we can point to, like the Mozart effect. Like, you, you learn Mozart and magically you're able to do this, right? And, or you listen to it and that will, by osmosis, come into you. This is a discipline and a way of thinking that can be taught and developed and honed and practiced and, 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 and emotionally and cognitively, creatively and intellectually. Um, I was teaching a seventh grade class in the inner city of Los Angeles, and I had uh, 30 kids that were seventh graders, um, and it was quite challenging. This was a, a school that uh, kids were from by lottery, and, and they were had went all over the map in terms of their abilities. And there was a lot of bullying between the Hispanic and the African American kids, which tends to happen uh, in terms of. Um, these were these uh, in, in our schools in South Central, and this one young man, Jose, was overweight. He was bullied. He was teased, 
and he's, his older brothers were in games, and he, and I knew that he was at risk. He was already getting in trouble. He was uh, taciturn. He wouldn't do, he didn't want to do anything. He was tr in trouble all the time, and, um, and really uh, difficult. And, and he was already behaving in a way that causing him to be rejected by the school and by his teachers and, you know, being labeled bad, right? And one day I brought my cello in, uh, to, for, to give them all an experience of playing it. And I saw his face change when he felt the vibrations in his body. And he began to want to play it more and more. And my mom was, uh, and still does work for the Young Musicians Foundation, we arranged to have a donation of musical instruments to that school. Well, his mother called me up and said, I miss Dr. Stevens, because I was always miss Dr. Stevens. You, know, you always miss, you know, so miss Dr. Stevens. Um, my son Jose really, really wants a cello. And I said, well, you know, you have to wait in line because they're gonna come and it's first come, first serve. Well, she was there, and this was a single mom. Uh, she was there like three hours, four hours before anybody else, waiting in line. Somehow she understood this too. Well, she he got the cello. And she calls me up and she said, well, Mr. Dr. Stevens, you wouldn't believe it. Jose, he keeps his cello by his bed when he goes to sleep and he takes it with him when we go to the market and when we go to the movies. And it was the first thing he had of his own that was beautiful and that was his own. And, and this young man, because of me catching that moment, where he was, everybody else was ready to, you know, well, it caught him and he felt cared for. He ended up uh, continuing to play a little bit, going into guitar. He ended up doing more in music, interestingly enough. But this, this, these moments where a person's imagination and sense of self and personal voice is captured um, is something that is, is, is unquantifiable in terms of the effects that music can have, the, the, the small effects that maybe are not seen in terms of uh, people that are, are the, the brilliant performers that we go to hear and see. Um, and so there's a quote that I love from a, a, a pediatrician um, that says, it's a delight to be hidden, but a disaster not to be found. And there are many ways of hiding. There are uh, getting in trouble is one, and being a smart aleck, and another one is being silent um, and being perfect. There are lots of ways to hide. We all find ways we hide, but we're all wanting to be found. And music is a way we find each other. It's our first language. It's our original language. It's the lullaby of our mother. And we sing to each other. Motherese is universal throughout the world. And we respond to the melody and, and the sound of each other's voice. Um, and we find each other through the language of music in whatever form that it takes. But we are also found through the performances we go to, to see and hear, where each of us are in a space and time together and are sharing these moments um, and are found together, each in a unique and different way. And I wanted to just have this picture, Henri Cartier-Bresson, about wonder. Um, we don't need fancy things. We, wonder and imagination happens and flourishes in any environment, no matter. It's not about money or about things. It's about the way we think and the way that we can see the beauty in each other and in the world and make meaning imaginatively through creative living. And that's the true creativity that then exemplifies itself through the different voices of different art forms um, and different people throughout our life. So with that, Brian's going to end with a piece that um, he calls prayer. And I believe that the intensely spiritual connection that happens through music is deeply personal and at the same time deeply universal. And so... This thought just occurred to me as you were speaking. When, I, when I'm calling prayer, is still an improvisation that is then unified, a unified language, something soothing, something that comes from the heart, something simple. And I have the idea of you putting on the initial slide, as you were talking about being hidden and being... Um, 
but not being discovered. Uh, what I got from that picture was you see this pianist out this floating, maybe being lost. When you, when you heard me play the original music, the way that I was responding to it was in sort of this jaunty, sea wavy way. And then as I hear Vicky talk about the transformation and hear the story of Jose, um, thank you, David, for being that spontaneous. I then chose to see this is an opportunity for this child, this creative entity out the sea that we can find and that we can capture and that we can bring into a beautiful life. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to use some of the same material. Okay.
And we, we've been talking, we knew there were a lot of you up here because we could hear your conversation. We have started to break it up, but the concert's going to start. And we're, this is a, a marvelous concert tonight for many reasons, but it is, has a wide variety of music and, and uh, of course, we have beautiful French horn player. I have a marvelous colleague that has joined me on the piano and with, as a composer, and we have a saxophone player, and we have a, haven't had a saxophone player. I can't tell you how long it's been, but many, many years ago. And if you haven't ever heard of a classical saxophone player, you're in for a treat. 